Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Titus Brown, who is an associate professor at UC Davis and the School of Medicine, uh, School of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, and when asked why the vet school, uh, well, he says, turns out animals have genomes too. Uh, good catch. Uh, before grad school at, at Caltech, he lived a free-spirited life at Reed College in Portland, Oregon. Um, at Caltech, he first studied evolution in the context of Earthshine, or the reflection of light from Earth to the moon, before coming to genomics. And since seeing the light of bioinformatics, Dr. Brown has studied regulatory networks, uh, evolution and development, and now studies microbial communities using high-quality community-driven software tools developed by the labs, such as KHMER, SourMash, and SpaceCraft Cats. His lab also runs uh, data uh, training in data intensive biology, both a meet and analyze data weekly meetup group at UC Davis and a summer two week long course for off campus people. Um, besides being a successful researcher and mentor, Thais is a champion for diversity, equity, and inclusion in science. Part of that happens through his pioneering work in open access papers, open source software, openly available data in the biology world. Back in 2012, he was already publishing a bio, as a biologist, publishing papers on, on, on archive before bioarchive even existed. So in the name of openness, he has also posted successful and failed grant applications online to his blog, living in an ivory basement, and has real scientific discussions, 280 characters at a time on Twitter. Outside of science, Titus hates running, but runs a lot, uh, recently, and has recently taken up yoga. He also enjoys clearing his mind with a refreshing swim, getting new kittens, and spending time with his two daughters. And with that, I'll let you take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Olga. Thank you again for the invitation. Um, let me see if I can start the slide sharing. Let's see now. OK, and looks like the slides are, sharing, are being shared. Excellent. OK, so. Um, let me start by saying uh, that uh, I've given a couple different remote presentations uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and so I sort of have, have put the, uh, I've sort of restructured my talks a little bit so that, whoops, and I, I got the wrong moderator in there, I'm sorry. Olga, I should have put Olga, not Denise. Um, so basically, uh, as I'm going along, if you have questions about what I'm talking about, please, please ask questions in the chat. Um, and then Olga and other moderators will, will interrupt me. And um, I also have a section, I also have four sections and I ask for open questions at the end of each section. And that's an opportunity for you to go forth and, and ask questions. Um, I have a, a, an Olga approved hashtag, Titus at Biohub, where you can post questions on Twitter. Um, I won't be monitoring Twitter during the talk, uh, but um, I'll look at it later. Okay, then, so without further ado, um, so my talk today is going to be about um, somewhere between the last five and ten years of work in my lab on looking at uh, large microbiome shotgun sequencing data sets. Um, in this case, I'm going to be talking about IBD, more on that in a sec. Uh, and as Olga said, I'm at the School, for, uh, School of Veterinary Medicine at UC Davis. Um, you can post questions on Twitter, and then if for some reason my network goes down or you want access to the slides afterwards, all of the slides that I'm presenting today are already available uh, at Titus Brown Talks OSF.io. That's, that's the Google query to use. Uh, and you can download the slides there if you're interested in referring back to them or asking questions about specific slides or anything like that. All right, so um, as long as everything's coming through okay, Olga, the thumbs up, the sound and video is okay? Excellent, all right. So um, I want to start with some acknowledgments. Um, so the work that I'm going to present today is really work that was um, primarily done or nucleated and done by four people in the lab. Uh, Dr. Phil Brooks, Taylor Ryder, Dr. Louise Erber, and Dr. Alicia Gingrich. I'll talk a little bit more about their roles later. But um, if I were to put, uh, if I were to properly acknowledge most of the slides in this talk, Taylor would be on every single slide. Um, because basically everything that I'm talking about is um, the product of the last two, three years worth of her uh, PhD work. Um, I also want to specifically acknowledge Luis Erber, who uh, literally finished his PhD thesis last Friday, so a week ago. Um, and he is really the behind a lot of the key technology that I'm, I'm going to be talking about, um, the Sour Mash technology that I'm going to be talking about in, in this talk. Um, and then Phil was a postdoc in the lab for a number of years who started this project. And uh, Alicia Gingrich is an MD, was an MD master's student in the lab who, um, it turns out, served a really important sort of consultation role in um, understanding uh, what was important about IBD. So 
so I, I, I'm going to present this talk through the light of sort of two different approaches. One is the biology question, which I'll ask in a couple slides. The, the question that I want to start with, though, is, is, is a computational question or microbiome question, which is um, if, if we uh, develop approaches that analyze missing or unanalyzed data in metagenomes, um, do we gain more power to understand disease? And in particular, um, we've noticed as we've been sequencing a lot of microbial genomes over the last uh, 20 odd years, we've seen that there are core genomes and pangenome elements present in most genomes. Um, core, the core genome is sort of genes that are present in every member of the species, and then accessory genes are elements that are present in strain variants of those species. And uh, often these accessory genome elements are not necessarily present in reference genomes. And do these elements play a role in disease? Um, there's some examples where they do, there's some examples where they seem to be neutral, and we're still really exploring this. And I think it's important to note that uh, for the rest of the talk that when we analyze metagenomes, often we miss accessory genome elements, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about why. And a lot of what we're doing is try to, trying to bring that back into, the, um, back into the analysis. So shotgun metagenomics, for those of you that are not metagenomicists, uh, is um, basically the outcome, the kind of data that you get when you uh, collect some samples, extract DNA without doing any further culturing, feed, those, feed that DNA into a sequencer, and then computationally analyze the resulting mixture. So the idea is that you're collecting environmental samples, or in the case of most of, of uh, in case of the 600 samples we're talking about in this talk, uh, um, stool samples, and then without doing any sort of enrichment other than sort of generic DNA level enrichment, you're sequencing what's in the mixture. And I like to, to joke that this, is, this, this, is a, this kind of data analysis is the biologists sequence it all and then let the bioinformaticians sort it out because it's very heavy on the computational analysis. Um, so the, the problem with shotgun metagenomics is that analyzing the results of shotgun metagenome sequencing really comes, has come down to two primary techniques. One is reference-based, and the idea here is that you use reference genomes. You take the shotgun reads that, that emerge usually from the Illumina sequencer these days, you map those reads to the reference, and you do downstream analysis on the mapped, on the mapped reads. And you more or less ignore the unmapped reads. There can be a lot of them, there can be few of them, but it's very hard to analyze millions to billions of, of just raw reads without further um, investment in, in other technologies. The other uh, the other approach that's used in metagenome analysis um, commonly is to build new reference genomes from the, the metagenomes that you have. And so the idea here is that you take all of the reads, you run de novo assembly, and you apply a variety of heuristics to construct genome bins that, um, at least in theory, uh, and seemingly in practice a lot of the time, represent um, the genomes of actual species that are present in your metagenome. And you then do downstream analysis on these genomes as sort of uh, functional components of the microbial community that you sequenced. So this, this, uh, this, these two dominant strategies leave a lot of room for what um, uh, Tracy Teal coined uh, opportunities. These are challenges and opportunities. So reference-based approaches miss metagenome-specific content. If you're if you're working with a collection of reference genomes and they don't reflect all of the content that's in your metagenome, um, then you're simply gonna gonna be ignoring. That, uh, that, that content, for example, it, um, accessory elements that are specific to a particular environment or a particular disease. With a de novo approach, not everything assembles or bins. So between 20 and 80% of metagenome content, depending on what you're analyzing, may go unanalyzed because it doesn't assemble. So, and even when all this all works pretty well, we have actually a really large number of genome sequences to look at if we're doing reference-based analyses. Um, most analysis tools don't scale to half a million isolate genome sequences. So I, what I'll say is my lab has been really obsessed with tackling these, these, this set of problems for the, last, for the last decade. So what I'm gonna show you today, and I'm gonna try and like put my cards out up front, right? I, um, I know I only have a limited time to hold your attention. Uh, what I'm gonna show you today is that when you're using reference independent approaches to probe IBD metagenomes, we see a consistent uh, inflammatory bowel disease associated signal in metagenomes. We can prioritize microbes based on their genomic contribution to the signal. We can, we've developed a novel pan-metagenomic analysis approach that can expand our understanding of which microbial strains are important. And then and we find a pan-genomic pan signature that is positively associated with Crohn's disease. 
And all of this put together suggests something that probably isn't terribly surprising, but we give you that we give we, we're building tools to analyze it. The previously unobserved accessory elements of known species may play a significant role in inflammatory bowel disease. Okay, so for an overall outline of the talk, I have it divided into four sections. There's the introduction to inflammatory bowel disease and the IBD data sets we're going to use. There's um, our observation that KMERS can capture important information about the data. Uh, we see that about 15% of IBD association in the KMERS is likely from accessory elements to known genomes. And we find that KMERS implicates strains of about four microbes in positive IBD association. Uh, and then I have some summary and next steps. Okay, so brief introduction to IBD. Inflammatory bowel disease uh, is a disease that affects a lot of people. Um, there are not really uh, high quality non-invasive diagnostics. And there's, there's been no consistent metagenomic signature of IBD across human studies with one, one exception. So inflammatory bowel disease affects about 1.3% of the US population. Um, there are two major IBD subtypes, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. They present very differently um, when you look, uh, um, when, you, when you diagnose them, usually through invasive procedures. And uh, it's a very serious disease that can lead to, um, uh, isn't, can lead to not just chronic illness, but, but acute um, disease and uh, hospitalization. There are, uh, as usual in, any, in, in many uh, diseases, there are many different potential causes. There's, there are known environmental factors, there are suspected genetic factors, there are gut microbiota that may play a role, and there's a lot of immune-related factors. And today I'm gonna focus entirely on the gut microbiota, um, and that's what I'll be talking about for the rest of today. So the biology question now is, is IBD associated with the contents of the gut microbiome uh, as measured through stool samples? And here I'm going to say the literature does not find consistent associations from large-scale microbiome studies in human. They do in mouse, but they don't in human. And it's not entirely clear why. I'm sure that there are, uh, can be many guesses. Um, consistency of environment, consistency of genetics in mice, consistency of diet probably all play a role. In human, the only real consistent signal is that there's a decreased diversity of gut microbiota in Crohn's disease. So, um, so that's, really the, that's really a sort of validation thing that we would be looking for uh, with our approaches. Okay, the um, meta cohort that we're gonna be using consists of six studies uh, detailed here. This includes the IHMP study, as well as a variety of other studies from a variety of different countries. And so um, in total, we're gonna be looking at 605 different shotgun metagenomes, 260 um, from people diagnosed with Crohn's disease, 132 from people diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, and 213 from people who do not have inflammatory bowel disease. Okay, so uh, section two. Um, the, the end statement of this section is going to be that KMERS capture important information about the data and identify 41 genomes as being worth uh, following up on. So I'm gonna show you that KMERS capture study variation. There's about 40,000 KMERS that are weakly predictive of IBD subtype. About 80% of KMERS anchor to about 1,100 known genomes, and about 20% of the KMERS are unknown. And then cross-study KMERS anchor to 41 genomes. So just to go back, just to sort of link back to the, the introductory slides, um, when you look at sort of state-of-the-art microbiome analyses, the current analysis techniques discard about 35% of the data. So here we have a figure from um, the IHMP work. It's actually from the supplemental material. And it details how many of the metagenome reads uh, from the HMP metagenomes align uh, via the HUMAN2 pipeline. And here you can see that you know, somewhere uh, south of 75% of the reads align per sample. Uh, so the mean is about 60% and the standard deviation is about 12.7%. This is across uh, 1,330 metagenome samples. This comes from the HUMAN2 log files. So this is using a reference-based approach where I think about 20,000 genomes are used and, and are aligned to, and then further uh, functional inference is performed based on the alignments to genes and so on in, the, in, the, uh, in those genomes. I just, did you wanna take questions as you go along? Um, I'll pause for questions in about four slides, I think. Great. Yeah, unless there's an urgent one, in which case, please interrupt. Is there an urgent we can, one? Uh, I think, Vida, you let me know. We can wait. Okay, cool. we can wait, excellent, okay. So, um, okay, so the initial sample processing that we did was we took, uh, the Taylor did, was we took the 605 metagenome samples, 
we did some human um, sequence removal. We did some uh, low abundance camera trimming um, using some specialized pipelines we've developed in the lab. And we ended up with about 92 billion uh, 31 MERS. And these are just, um, I, I probably should have introduced KMERS more clearly, sorry. These are just uh, every, every sequence and all of the reads um, extracted into 31 bases and then collapsed down to unique or distinct 31 MERS. There's 92 billion 31 MERS. Um, and then we uh, use the SourMash software to hash and downsample these to approximately 46 million, at which point um, uh, um, we then extracted all that we re removed any that weren't present to seven, uh, that weren't present in multiple samples. So we threw away any KMERS that were um, present in, in only one sample. And I think you know, a key point here is that this is both assembly independent and reference independent. We did no de novo assembly. We did no reference-based uh, analysis at this point. Um, another point is that 92 billion uh, KMERS is an awful lot. It's about um, 45 times the number of unique 31 MERS that are present in the human genome. And I think it's, it's really worth pointing out that uh, even, even sort of mid-level diversity host-associated microbes from microbiomes from humans contain a ridiculous amount of sequence diversity. And so dealing with a scaling challenge is one of the big things that my lab has been focused on for uh, over a decade now. Okay, um, so the first question we wanted to ask was, do these KMERS capture biological variation? Uh, and so um, this is a pairwise Jacquard similarity between each of the six pairwise between each of the 605 metagenomes uh, done on a um, uh, principal coordinates analysis. And um, essentially what we see is that uh, when we do a permanova, we see that about 6.2% of the signal in the data set in these KMERS corresponds with diagnosis. We have other correspondences, for example, 6.6% correlates with study, 9.9% .9 correlates with KMER diversity, which is sort of an indication of sequencing depth and other things, and about 0.009% is correlates with library size. And these are all significant associations. If we hadn't seen this, we probably would have stopped the study at this point because there's no signal in the KMERS to, 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 uh, to elucidate. But 6.2% uh, 6 6, 6 is actually good enough for us to then pursue. So um, Taylor then did, uh, then applied machine learning using random forests. And I'm not gonna a detail, this is a fairly standard study design or cross-validation design. It's a leave one out cross-validation study design. Um, Taylor applied variable selection to reduce the total number of features from 7.4 million KMERS down to between 30 to 42,000 uh, for each of the six left out studies. And then for each study, we used random forests to build classifiers for the IBD subtype. So we had metadata annotations for non-IBD, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's disease for each sample. And then we evaluated each classifier on the study that was held out from uh, training and um, I've just forgotten the, the word, it's not training and validation. So, um, so our first result from this stage is that KMERS weakly predict IBD subtype, and it varies dependent on the study. So in some cases, we get um, an accuracy of prediction of about 75.9%, all the way down to about 49.1%. Um, and this is, this is uh, in all cases, better than any of the known, uh, any of the published predictions. Uh, and we use about 25 to 40K KMERS per classifier. I should say that on the IHMP, this approximately matches what, um, the uh, Lloyd Wright paper found about 50%, but we do better on all of the other studies. So again, this gave us hope that there was signal in them there hills. Um, and so we then said, okay, let's, 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 let's do, let's break our rule and go uh, see how many of these KMERS belong to known genomes. And so we found that about 80% of, import, of these important KMERS can be identified by searching the 500,000 known genomes. There's actually more, I have the number um, I can give you the exact number of how many we searched, but it's in the neighborhood of half a million. And basically we can anchor these KMERS to um, about 1150 isolate or predicted genomes. And so you can see here that um, the, the database you use actually matters quite a bit in terms of RefSeq genomes, which are high quality uh, genomes often from isolates, but not always. We can usually analyze, we can usually annotate between 40 and 55% of the KMERS. If you include GenBank, which is a much larger collection of genomes, you get another 16% approximately. And if you include a bunch of the magnified genomes, these include genomes, for example, from um, Naifach et al, Katie Pollard's lab, you can generally add another 10 to 15% of identification. And only about 20% of the KMERS, depending on the study, 20 to 25% of the KMERS remain um, 
unanchored in some sense to an isolate genome. That's still a lot. That's, that's you know, a quarter of the data in some cases, but at least we can sort of um, uh, do, the, uh, do the anchoring. And then the last, uh, the last two data slides before I take some questions. So um, if, you, if you further limit yourself to cross-study KMERS, if we further limit ourselves just to cross-study KMERS, we find that there are 41 genomes that show up in five out of the six, uh, um, sorry, it's, it's complicated. There are, if you take only KMERS that show up in five out of the six uh, studies as being important, um, and then you anchor those, you, you end up reducing the number of genomes you're looking at down to uh, 41. And this covers a substantial amount, about 40 to 50% of the cumulative variable importance as measured by random, the random forest model. And this, of course, is the signal that we're very interested in because we're interested in cross-study signal for the purpose of building a cross-study uh, um, uh, biomarker assay and, other, and, and also just sort of studying genomic contributions. Um, I will say at this point, we're going to come back to these, but some of the microbes are, are familiar. Uh, it gave us, gives us even more hope. These are things that have been seen before. For example, fe fecal bacterium prausnitzi. Um, there are five separate strains represented in these 41 genomes. This is a butyrate producing bacteria that is anti-inflammatory, and uh, it's been found to have decreased abundance in Crohn's disease patients. Uh, Ruminococcus navis is another genome that we find in these 41. Uh, one specific clade of them is enriched in IBD patients and blooms of Ruminococcus navis sometimes correlate with increased disease severity. And we'll return to these microbes a little bit later. So at this point, I'll take questions. Let me just restate. Um, basically, we took 600 metagenome data sets, we uh, folded, spindled, and mutilated them into KMERS, and then we found interesting KMERS via random forest machine learning. We selected cross-study KMERS, and then we anchored these KMERS to genomes. And the next question is going to be, do we gain any biological insight from this? But I can pause and take some questions now. So let's see. Chat. Yeah, there's okay. quite a few questions that accumulated. Okay, um, yeah, that's great. Okay. First, uh, so first, Vita had asked about host gene expression in, uh, in IB, IBD, and Taylor answered actually, uh, saying yes. that it was not yet explored, but there's an extensive body of work. Um, and, it'd be, and Vita uh, followed on to ask, uh, we would love to know if there are disease-specific signatures or are genus or taxon-specific of the microbiome. Yeah, I, I, um, so I guess I'm getting, I'm a little bit confused. Uh, um, I guess my question was um, if, if there are, if there is a host-specific signature, is that a reflection of IBD or is that a reflection of the microbiome? Ah, that's a very good question and I, don't actually know the answer to that. Uh, maybe Taylor will. Maybe Taylor will answer both. <laughs> of course. Um, so I'd be happy to provide some references if you're interested. Uh, so uh, I'll take Josh, Josh's question: How many of the 96 billion occurred in multiple samples? So that was the 7.5 approximately that we ended up at the at the end. Um, and so then there's a separate question: What's the reasoning behind the hashing, and what is lost in the thousandfold collapsing, and what is gained? So the main thing that is gained is that we can actually apply machine learning to the um, data set. Um, the thousandfold collapsing is a little bit harder to justify, right? Without it, we wouldn't be able to run this analysis. It's actually two thousandfold collapsing. Um, uh, we wouldn't be able to run the analysis, and I'm not going to talk too much about the um, the method for collapse. We essentially do uh, density um, systematic density sampling at a ratio of one in two thousand across all of the KMERS. The idea is that we're evenly selecting without any bias across all of the KMERS using a sort of min-hash style approach. And this lets us downsample the data set um, and lose resolution. It's kind of a lossy compression approach, but without necessarily throwing away, without doing systematic um, discarding of uh, biological signal, right? If, if there's a signal uh, that is sort of, you can, an analogy that is imperfect, as you can imagine, we're, we're selecting markers every two kV along a genome. Um, and on average. And so we might lose things that are lower, that are smaller than that. We might lose features that are smaller than that. But uh, at the sa same time, we, we also reduce the data to the point where we can actually do the analysis. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about that with you uh, later. Um, we, have some publication we have some publications on it, uh, and we have a bigger publication that's resulting from Luis's thesis. Um, is there a measure of how accurate those identifications are? Slide 24. So presumably this is talking about the 1150 um, 
or the 41 genomes. And um, uh, this is still unpublished. It's again, it's part of Luis's thesis, but uh, we found that using SARMASH to do taxonomic identification um, is uh, when benchmarked using the CAMI benchmark, the mouse um, microbiome benchmark that is, uh, I think gonna be part of the next round of CAMI, um, that we score uh, essentially in the top two by um, almost all of the measures. So uh, I'm happy to tell you more about what we're doing there. Our experience has been that it is um, competitively accurate. Uh, and it's also, um, uh, there's a word that I'm looking for. It's also considerably more scalable than essentially any of the other approaches, which matters quite a bit when you're looking at, at half a billion. Uh, but these are all, I think, I think just to respond more broadly to Josh, really what, what I'm really large part of the, the, the talk is actually validating, seeing if we can, we can reach the end and, and back validate the approaches that we used by, by uncovering something uh, um, from this analysis. Um, sorry, that's for, both for Brian and for, for Josh. Do you find better predictability for one of the IBD subtypes over the other? Yes, Christina. So I actually eliminated that slide from the talk because I was running out of room. Um, we have a much better prediction uh, approach for, we have much better prediction results for Crohn's disease than for ulcerative colitis. And we're not 100% a, a sure why um, that is. Uh, it may be due to limitations in the metadata. Um, uh, it may simply be due to a decreased microbiome signature of ulcerative colitis. Uh, it may be due to um, the presentation of the disease in the gut. Um, so uh, it, it may, you know, Crohn's disease is what we're currently focused on. Uh, because of that. Uh, William asks, what fraction of reference genome KMERS are ambiguous? Yes. Is there separate annotation for KMERS that map to mobile genetic elements, either species specific or broad host range? Yeah. Um, the answer is it's complicated. Um, the way we do assignment is we find the reference genome that best matches to, a, to combinatorially to a collection of KMERS based on the best containment of the KMERS in that reference genome. We then subtract that and uh, those KMERS from the query and iterate on the query. So everything we're doing is anchored to a specific genome with a specific taxonomy. And we don't, with this approach, we don't do good annotate, we, we, we can using other techniques, but we don't do good annotation for KMERS that map to mobile genetic elements. And I don't think that in the gut, we have, for the gut genomes, we have good annotations of what are mobile species specific or broad host range genetic elements yet. Um, we probably do for a subset. And, you know, uh, if we did that analysis, I'm positive that we would find um, many mobile genetic elements, but I'm not sure we would know too much about their range given the annotation of many of the genomes. Um, that is an excellent question that we should be able to answer better. Okay. So I will uh, go back to presenting and then stop again at about five slides for, for more questions. Okay, so, so the next question is, can we go beyond these 41 genomes? So it's nice that we have uh, 41 genomes that anchor important cross-study KMERS, but what I didn't tell you is that by, limp, by, by sort of focusing down to uh, these 41 genomes, we lost about 50% of our predictive power from the random forest model. We ended up ignoring 1,100 genomes, right? We, we originally, uh, classified anchored these KMERS to 1100 genomes, 1150, and now we're only looking at 41. So that seems problematic. Um, and then we also leave 30.6% of the cross-study important KMERS unidentified because they don't, they don't match to these uh, important genomes. So we're basically back to this conundrum that we had at the beginning. The current metagenome analysis approaches that are based on references leave some information on the table. So what I'm going to tell you about in this next section is that um, a different approach, a different tool, and a different analysis approach we developed to ask this question. And the results are that about 15% of IBD association is likely in accessory elements to known genomes. Um, and the numbers here are that about 86% of the total predictive KMERS are in 41 pan genomes, and 74.5% of total predictive power is held in the pan genomes. So um, I'll tell you a little bit more about what I mean by pan genomes in a slide or two, but the method here uh, was published a couple, came out a couple weeks ago, I think it was, in um, Genome Biology. Uh, the title of the paper is Exploring Neighborhoods in Large Metagenome Assembly Graphs Reveals Hidden Sequence Diversity. And this is a collaboration with some graph theorists and computational people. 
um, Blair Sullivan's group now at Utah State and Dominic Moritz, uh, who is now a, an, actually an assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon, but at the time was at UW. And what, what this tool, Spacecraft Cats, lets us do is it lets us analyze and examine genome neighborhoods in large metagenome assembly graphs in order to retrieve potential accessory elements. So to, so to explain that a little bit, the idea is we index a bunch of, we index a metagenome sample, uh, we index the assembly graph from a metagenome sample, we take a query genome, we ask which uh, region of the assembly graph does this query genome belong to in the assembly graph, and then we expand around that query genome by some given radius in this, in this analysis, it's all radius one in the compact to brain graph, to pull in things that didn't make it into the query genome, but may belong to it or its neighborhood. And our, our uh, statement is that um, these are potential accessory elements or strain variation that didn't make it into the reference database, but nonetheless effectively belong to this query genome. And uh, when I refer to pan genome, what I'm referring to is the, uh, in a more technical sense, is the, um, assembly, assemb the compact de Bruyne graph neighborhood of the query genome in an actual metagenome. Uh, and I, I think it's important to note this is an assembly independent query. We're not actually outputting contigs or anything uh, from, for our to, to analyze the metagenome. We're loading the metagenome into an assembly graph and then querying directly into the assembly graph and retrieving the reads that belong to those components of the assembly graph and then trying to figure out what to do with those. So for this data set, um, we conducted 41 queries against, we, Taylor, conducted 41 queries against 605 metagenomes and ended up retrieving 25,000 pan genomes, one for each query genome in each metagenome. Um, and so the first result from this is really cool. We were able to recover 74.5% uh, uh, of the total variable importance across all of the studies um, by looking at these pan genomes. So starting only from the cross-study camers, which are here denoted in red uh, on this upsetter, we um, recover the majority of important camers for each study. So what this suggests, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but what this suggests is that the neighborhoods of these query genomes are actually hold relevant information in the, pan geno in the metagenomes. Um, and that information actually uh, is what's being used by the classifiers for each individual study. Uh, and so in essence, we're able to, to go fishing with these cross-study um, uh, KMERS and recover a much broader set of data that is relevant to individual studies. So that suggests overall that um, pan genomes play, may play an important role. The other thing that, that we can now say is that when we look at all of the databases plus the neighborhood queries with the original predictive KMERS, we gain about five, four to five percent of the KMERS are now identifiable using these 41 pan genomes. So again, that suggests that our original um, these were things that didn't anchor to any genome at all, and now we can actually identify them using these pan genome neighborhoods um, as probably belonging to one or more of these 41 pan genomes. So uh, at this point, I'll stop to take some questions. I'll just reiterate, we get about 86% of the total predictive KMERS to be found in 41 pan genomes, and about 75% of the total predictive power is held in these 41 pan genomes. All right, let us go back to chat, which is... All right. Um, so Josh, uh, Joshua asks, uh, Joshua Batson asks, are these pan genomes then lists of reads? So they're actually, um, let's see, uh, what we get are files full of reads. <laughs> uh, we can then do whatever we want with those reads. Um, we can try to assemble them. We can try to map them. We can uh, decompose them to cameras and do other things. Uh, and essentially sort of we're subselecting portions of the metagenome in, um, at the read level, yes. Um, is the improved classifier performance based on subtypes? The impact of core genome X depends on the presence of pangenome element Y. Did we fit a hierarchical model? So we didn't actually redo the classification here. Um, this is from the original uh, random forest. Um, uh, we took, we identified the 41 pen, the 41 genomes that we used to construct the pan genomes based on these cross study cameras in the lower left and the red. And then when we looked at the pan genomes, we recovered um, the large majority of the uh, variable importance 
um, important k-mers across all of the studies in those pan genomes. So classifier, um, the classifier uh, performance didn't change, but our ability to um, tentatively identify k-mers that were or hashes that were uh, dif uh, discovered as important by the random forest model did improve. Right. Okay. <laughs> so uh, Byron asks, hi, Byron. Um, uh, Byron asks, this was all done at radius one in the compact brine graph. Is it surprising that you don't need a larger radius to account for that much of the flagged kamers? Um, thanks for highlighting that. Um, it is, to me, it is astonishing um, that with a, a, a fairly small radius, we recover so much extra. Uh, we haven't gone back and done it at a higher radius, and there's two reasons for that. One is it's very computationally intensive. Um, that's okay, we have a lot of compute. Um, the other is that, well, a second reason is that we struggled to interpret the results of the first of just radius one, and, and maybe we'll go back and do that either for this work or, or in a little bit for, for more work. We have other fish to fry, so to speak, here as well. Um, I think the, the biggest concern with adopting a larger radius is that we, we don't really know what the impact is going to be. And I would start to worry about um, two things happening. One is that some of the metagenome assembled genomes that we use, are using are contaminated. And so the larger radius is gonna bring in even larger chunks of the, contaminated, um, of the contaminants. So far for a radius of one, the, the extra taxonomic signal from the, from the contamination doesn't seem to be really very significant. Um, uh, we haven't yet summarized that well, but it doesn't seem to be that big based on a variety of different analyses. Um, but it's something to worry about as you sort of reach out more broadly into the graph. The other thing that I would say is that um, I would just worry in general about, uh, about expanding beyond the domain of the accessory elements. We don't really have um, I, maybe I'm being too honest here, but we don't really have a good model for how microbial species behave in metagenomes. And I worry that, and this is especially true at the compact to point graph level, so I worry that as we increase this parameter, we're essentially going to increase our sensitivity, but also decrease our specificity a lot. We don't really have a, I can think of ways to measure that, but I, uh, that would be a whole, a whole other research project. So we're definitely gonna do that, but we haven't done it yet. So I worry about just doing that. Okay, so um, right, okay, so here we are. So the next question is, can we go beyond these 41 pan genomes? We find these 41 genomes that anchor important cross study. 5% of predictive cameras. Pettis, your audio cut out for a second. Okay, how about now? Yeah, uh, okay. it seems good now. Maybe that's okay. just me. Okay, so um, um, I think just to summarize the slide, right? Kamers aren't biology. The fact that we can anchor these kamers to genomes and we can, can recover variable importance for a, a decent classifier is does not lead us directly to biology. So what can we do about about gaining biological insight? So um, the last section of results is this: we find that kamers implicate strains of four microbes in positive IBD association. So we see a general decrease in the abundance of the 41 important genomes in Crohn's disease. This matches the previous results for, for um, IBD and, and CD in particular. We also see a decrease in the number of, of open reading frames per genome in the individual Crohn's disease microbiomes, indicating that, that there's less pangenome diversity in each sample. And then in the background of this general decrease, we do find that there are four specific strains that seem to be increasing their abundance. And that, um, that is an interesting correlation. So um, the first result is that when we, uh, when we look at the 41 genomes and we look across Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and we use a tool called, um, uh, sorry, and we use a tool called corn cob to measure the uh, increase or decrease in abundance. We find that by and large, as you can see sort of down the middle here, these gray, um, these gray uh, uh, bars, the light gray bars, these are hashes that are anchored, or kamers that are anchored to those genomes that uh, decrease in abundance. Um, the dark gray are kamers that anchor to these genomes that increase in abundance. And by and large, you can see that the vast majority of kamers decrease in abundance in Crohn's disease, which means they're uh, essentially less abundant in Crohn's disease than in um, uh, non-IBD, the non-disease state. 
However, we do see a certain amount of signal uh, here, two flavonifractor genomes, um, an acetata, uh, sorry, a phycocatina navis, this is ruminococcus navis, and then clostridium uh, boltier, where there's actually large numbers of camers, um, up to half in some cases, that increase in abundance in Crohn's disease. So that was uh, very interesting, very intriguing. And um, when we go through the process of doing the pangenome assembly for those four, for the reads from those four uh, pan metagenome neighborhoods, and we use salmon, we, there's a, a long and complicated pipeline that involves doing the assembly, um, uh, extracting open reading frames, uh, predicting, predicting genes, um, uh, removing redundant genes using CD hit, and then applying um, salmon to, to measure the abundance uh, of the um, genes in that assembly, and then using corn cob for differential expression analysis, we find that uh, in fact, there's about 7,000 genes in the Clostridium boltier pan genome that increase in abundance and 981 that decrease and 3,000 that increase in uh, Ruminococcus navis or Phycalaticatina navis using the uh, GTDB taxonomy, 3,000 that decrease and so on. So um, that's pretty cool. That brings it down to a gene level. And uh, this is not always my favorite kind of, of picture to show, but where we are with this analysis is that when we do eggnog to, do, uh, to look into the keg annotations for these um, uh, genes that are um, upregulated, we find a number of interesting things. And I, I, I don't know how, how seriously to treat this just yet. We're, uh, we're need to dig a lot more into these genes, but we do see that um, genes for flagellar assembly are enriched in three of four pan genomes. And this is flagella, uh, flagellar motility is known to be um, involved in disease state as well as pathogenesis, uh, initial infection and pathogenesis. Um, and then we also see vancomycin resistance enriched in two of the four pan genomes. And this is important because um, uh, patients with IBD are, are more likely to end up in the hospital and often they'll be treated with um, things like vancomycin and this might not be a good idea. Uh, so um, and there's, some, there's some literature that suggests that vancomycin resistance is in fact um, a concern in Crohn's disease more generally. Okay, so, so that's where we are. We've sort of gotten to the point where we have a bunch of genes. We have a bunch of, of we have four, four genomes that uh, where um, the genome abundance on average is either staying steady or decreasing in a background of generally decreasing genome abundance and diversity. And we find subsets of these genomes suggesting that perhaps these are um, specific strains of these genomes that aren't clearly in the databases that increase. The genes in those strains, um, uh, we can isolate the genes in those strains. We can annotate them uh, to particular kinds of functions that may make sense. Uh, and um, that's where we are right now. So um, I think the next steps in the IBD specific project are to explore the association of genetic elements with disease directly. So for example, we see that downsampled camers and gene abundances have a really significant association, but we don't see that there are disease specific accessor elements, at least not at the DNA level. There may be in sort of gene complement level. Um, it would also be nice to validate, cross-validate the results using different data sets. So, so far everything we've done is based on those six metagenome studies. Uh, and if there's other types of data out there that we could use, we're, we're, we, we have some in mind, we're thinking about whether we can cross-validate and, and what the best cross-validation approach would be um, that doesn't just rely on, uh, I don't want to say just, but that doesn't rely on more analysis of the same underlying data, but actually brings in other data or even other studies. Um, so at this point, I'll take some more questions. I see there's a couple waiting in chat. I'll just restate this. We see a general decrease in the abundance of these 41 genomes in Crohn's disease. This sort of matches what's in the literature. We see a decrease in the number of open reading frames per genome in, an, in these individual Crohn's disease microbiomes, indicating the less pangenome diversity in each sample. And then in the background of this general decrease, we see four specific strains that are increasing uh, the abundance of at least some of their genetic elements based on hashes and on genes. So let me move to the chat. Are the four strains increasing in absolute abundance or are they only increasing in relative abundance? They're increasing in abundance relative to the non-disease state. Um, I don't think we would have the ability to look at absolute abundance in the microbiome given the data that was collected. Um, 
Uh, William is uh, William Burkholder is uh, flogging a horse uh, and asking, could homologous recombination eggnog annotations be from site-specific recombinases used by mobile genetic elements? Uh, that is an excellent question and an excellent thing that we should look at. Right now, we wouldn't uh, we didn't haven't looked at that. Um, so Joshua Batson, in the initial PCOA, it seemed like there was one subtype which was easy to identify in the region of PCA space where cases and controls were mixed. Were you able to identify the bacterial signatures of that easy part? Um, I'm trying, I, I have an answer. Let me just think about the right way to say it. I think that that initial um, subtype was a little bit of a chimera. Um, there is no clearly partitioned signature in PCOA space based on the metadata that we have. Um, we have a suspicion that uh, for, that I think that, I think I believe that signature, Taylor can, can tell me if I'm wrong, but I believe our suspicion about that signature is that there may in fact be, if we had better metadata, um, if we had metadata that distinguished between colonic and non-colonic Crohn's disease, that, that part of that signature might be more interpretable. Right now it's sort of spread across um, multiple principal components and, and we didn't feel like that was a good thing to pursue compared to the other things that we were seeing. All right, Josh Elias. Yeah, have you identified the overlap of KMERS between host and pan genome? I'm thinking about host mimicry by microbes, initial step of subtracting host sequences would prevent this. Holes in the KMERS set might be apparent. Hmm, I mean, I'd have to think about, I'd have to look at the literature a little bit, but. My basic assumption is that there's my, my intuition, and I guess I'll say it, intuition and assumption at the same time without in the absence of data analysis is that there's very little overlap in 31 mer space between the human genome and um, microbial genome space. And by very little overlap, I would guess it would be under one, well under 1%, um, but I don't know that for sure. Um, so we have not evaluated it, but that is also an excellent question that we will we'll have to dig into. Okay, so just to summarize, so um, the literature doesn't find the sort of IBD work. The literature doesn't find consistent associations between microbes and IBD subtype from large-scale microbiome studies in human. We think we, we do. Uh, we find a consistent signal. It's not a huge signal, but it is a consistent signal across multiple studies and hundreds of samples, 605. We find that accessory elements, or what we believe are accessory elements of four microbial genomes that are present in the metagenomes play a significant role in this association, and that's what we're digging into now. So um, I'm gonna now uh, shift gears a little bit and say, um, my lab doesn't actually work on IBD particularly, uh, and what I wanna talk about is method improvement. And here I'm gonna, I'm gonna channel Katie Pollard, who came to uh, UC Davis many months ago, pre-pandemic, so, uh, a century ago or more, and gave this great gave several great talks about all of the really cool um, microbiome analyses that she was working on. And um, she she got to give I was jealous she got to give like a third of a talk on like thinking about methods and data analysis as a strong and critical component of any biology project. And so this this is my this is my um, ode to ode to Katie. Um, so. You know, the story that I told you is really a story about method improvement. Um, we, we have developed several tools, uh, SourMash uh, and Spacecraft Cats, that let us do annotation independent association analysis using all of the data, or at least uh, some rep uh, 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 an even representation of all of the data. We used many more genomes than previous studies were able to, again, because we could use SourMash to analyze half a million genomes or more. We were able to provide strain level specificity using SourMash, and I'm happy to provide um, uh, references, although they're all they're still in the process of being written up and submitted, but are, but I can give you the the links and PDFs. And then um, we're able to use this tool, Spacecraft Cats, uh, to analyze and annotate KMERS against potential accessory genome el genome elements using um, recovering them directly from metagenomes. Um, but this is so this is but this isn't just a story about methods improvement. It's actually also a story about lab culture and uh, what I'm going to call neighborliness, for for lack of a better word. So Phil joined the lab as a postdoc and got interested in um, sour mash and IBD. 
And he said, hey, we should really analyze this. And at the time, this was like five years ago, we really didn't have the capacity or the tooling to do it. Taylor, who came, who's a graduate student in food sciences, um, uh, chatted a lot with Phil while he was in the lab. And um, I'll tell you a little bit more about this later in another slide or two, and decided to, to, that IBD was a really great thing to look at. And three years later, when we actually had the tools, started to look at it. Taylor was also sitting immediately adjacent to Luis, who is getting his PhD in computer science, developing Sour Mash and, and hey the guys, underlying. Hey guys, be careful with this door because the aquatic is really not that great. And so don't open it a whole Okay, so um, so Luis, who was getting his PhD in computer science, was sitting next to Taylor, uh, and was able to um, adjust some of the computational techniques to meet Taylor's needs, and also could basically solve computational problems for Taylor as part of his own work. And then both of them were sitting immediately adjacent to a, an MD master's student in the lab who actually knew a lot about IBD because it turns out doctors study IBD. Um, and so she's, uh, she's currently a resident in the School of Medicine. She's, she's finished her master's. So it was really nice that these people could all hang out in the lab together pre-pandemic and talk about their shared problems. And Taylor could enlist the help of all these different people in um, analyzing uh, her data. Um, I also wanted to say this is largely a story of hypothesis-free exploration. We didn't set out, we didn't develop these tools in order to analyze IBD. We didn't set out to analyze HMP data we're not, we weren't really focused on human health. And it actually took us four years to develop both Sour Mash and Spacecraft Cats because we had a lot of different interesting questions that we wanted to ask on large scales. And then Taylor, um, actually against more or less my, my preference, said, we have these tools, I have the data, I'm just gonna try this. I'm just gonna try this random forest approach on these Sour Mash features. And so a lot of the exploratory work up until about six months ago was done by Taylor sort of, um, in, in, uh, in her downtime from other projects. So um, uh, there's a really nice paper out that uh, entitled Hypothesis is a Liability. Um, and I think that this is a really good message to get across to uh, biomedical data scientists um, and biologists more generally. Uh, in this paper, they actually sh constructed an artificial data set that when you plotted it, uh, had the picture of a gorilla in it. And then they basically gave it to two different sets of students and said, um, what, what, can you, uh, what can you find out about this data set? And some of the students were selected to take a hypothesis focused approach, and some of them were, were chosen to take a hypothesis free approach. And the gorilla was discovered uh, more frequently by the hypothesis free uh, approaches than by the hypothesis focused approaches, presumably because the hypothesis free people started out by graphing the data and saw that there was a gorilla. So uh, the citation is on the lower right. So I think that it's really worth noting that um, hypotheses can lead you astray by artificially, strong hypotheses up front can lead you astray by sort of artificially narrowing your, um, uh, your, your, your focus. Um, okay, one or two more slides. Uh, computational methods development is really critical. Um, my lab really works to increase the space of adjacent possibility with tool development. We try to build open source tools that are well engineered. Uh, we try to generally increase the documentation tutorials. We, we connect with the community and we try to generalize our software beyond any one project or collaborator. And it, the trade-off in this is that it generally takes us four to six years per tool. So it's a lot of work. Um, Sour Mash is a, is a tool that does a lot more than what I've shown here. Uh, it's being used for microbial taxonomy, RNA-seq analysis, massive scale sequence read archive search, and so on. We have over 30 contributors and we think in the neighborhood of a thousand users. Um, uh, Dr. Olga Botvinnik, Pranathi Vimuri, and Phoenix Logan, all from Biohub, are, are contributors. Um, and I would also like to acknowledge uh, Tessa Pierce, Laurent Gauthier, and Tim Head, who are also significant Sour Mash contributors. Space Graph Cats was really a, a product of four years of collaboration with graph theorists, led by Blair Sullivan, um, at, uh, now at University of Utah. And um, uh, everything we do is open source, so you're free to go poke around. All of the workflows and many of the results described here are fully available on GitHub at these URLs. And I think I will stop and take a couple of minutes of questions. So thank you very much for listening and thanks again for the invitation. Resounding applause from everyone. <laughs> that was really great, Titus. Um, uh, if anyone else has any questions, I think you're honestly the perfect person to have as our first remote talk since wow, okay. um, you actually uh, know how to do this. <laughs> well, um, thanks, Olga. Yeah, and 
maybe uh, we can start with some of the questions from the chat first, um, where Bill asks, um, if for IBD, is it possible that a causative organism could in, would initiate the disease, but then disappear or deplete from the persistent microbiome, leaving ongoing disease, but, uh, but little to no signature of its having been there? Yes, um, so Taylor's already answered this in the chat, but basically, um, you know, we're looking at one time point, um, and uh, what we would want to do, this may be one of the things we do for cross-validation, either for this project or for, for this paper or for the next paper, would essentially look at time series in the future. And those, those present different statistical challenges. So we are, um, you know, and we already have uh, something that's sort of ridiculously complicated to explain. So I'm a little nervous about layering on more data analysis here, but it may be an important part of the validation for sure. Um, are there any other questions? I think it's okay to um, interrupt to, to just come on voice and, and ask them in voice. Yeah, please unmute yourself. Hey, so um, I have a question. Um, sure. First of all, great talk. Thank you for sharing your research with us. Sure. Um, so I have uh, some experience uh, for while working on microbiome uh, projects uh, mm -hmm. using SARMASH. And one thing okay. I've noticed is that if I, for example, uh, if I uh, run through sequencing data from just one strain that I sequence, it's an isolate, um, I would and then ask it to assign taxonomy. Uh, there is a significant level of uh, what I would call noise, but basically it will say that your metagenome contains maybe 99% of this strain or sometimes 95% right. of mm -hmm. this strain and 5% of a collection of other things. Uh -huh. uh, at, so is that uh, like, is there a solution for that? Does, do you see that? Or um, because at certain points, the 5% noise is not going to be uh, good enough for, for certain applications if you want to see strains that you know are there that are at like, let's say 1%. So I just want to ask, what are your uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, I have a couple of thoughts. So, so there's, there's sort of multiple different things going on uh, that could be going on. So one is that the SARMASH downsampling, which is the very first thing that we do, literally discards 99.9% .9 of the data. So of course, um, there's going to be a, a limit to the resolution between two different um, between two different strains that are very similar. Uh, we have a project with Boris Vinotzer where they've been able to show that our strain identification is good as long as the strains aren't like closer than, you know, uh, 0.1 uh, one, between 0.1% and 1% average nucleotide identity. So, so there's simply a limit to resolution with, that comes with the scalability of SARMASH for sure. Um, there's another aspect to there, which is measuring the theoretical bounds. And uh, that's something that we're working on so that we can do, sort of do the right parameter choice. Um, my suspicion about what you're talking about, though, is what I suspect is going on is probably the dominant contribution is actually the, the database dependency. So um, SARMASH can be thought of, SARMASH taxonomic identification can be thought of as a database lookup, right? We're, we're not doing much in the way of generalization um, across evolutionary distance. So either the strain or strains you're looking for are in your database and are correct or they're not. And that's a, that's a really tough uh, criterion, right? Because our databases are problematic. Um, I, I, I think, let, just to finish, and then I'll, I'll ask you, uh, I'm happy to take a second question, but just to finish that, one of the things that we're trying to, to figure out how to explore using SourMesh and Spacecraft Cats is, is sort of this pangenomic component. Um, it's not entirely clear how to assign elements that are shared or somewhat shared between strains to taxonomically. So um, I, I think it's just an uns there's an uncertainty there, at least for me, in how to handle that. Thank you. Great question, though. Yeah, we, we yeah, happy to chat more, too. <laughs> Okay, so I'd like to ask you about, um, so your discussion about the strength of hypothesis-free versus yeah. hypothesis-driven approaches, that's great. That is actually the single strongest argument I've ever seen for the value of hypothesis-free <laughs> approaches. Um, I tend to be a really strong advocate for hypothesis-driven approaches. Um, 
And so I like, let, let me sort of give you my distilled version of the argument and, and get, get your sense for, you know, whether there may be different classes of problems where one way of thinking about it is useful versus another. So the, with hypothesis driven, the real value of it is that if you have strong expectations, so it's, a, it's actually a way of helping the experimenter with pattern identification. So they have a very strong hypothesis. So um, actually two aspects. One, if you have a very strong hypothesis, it can really help you in the design of the experiment incorporating key controls because you know, some of the hypothesis, some of the alternative, it's most useful to think of it in terms of what are alternative models? What, what's your motivating model? And then what are very likely alternative models uh, for what you're trying to understand? And then designing into the experiment, um, designing the experiment to best distinguish between, say, your top two models. But there are, then are other, you know, sort of trivial models like, you know, the enzyme doesn't work or things like that. And that those serve to help you design effective controls. So that when you run the experiment and you get your data, you've sort of set things up to be able to efficiently test between likely models. Uh, but then the thing is with, you know, it will often happen, that your data comes back not fitting any of your models. And so one of the values then of having sort of def, uh, articulate these models ahead of time is that if the data comes back in an unexpected, th that's unexpected, you are prepared to be surprised and say, oh, well, you know, models one, two, and three are not likely to be the case. It's probably something else. And that sends you back in, in that sort of iterative approach. Whereas if you don't have strong expectations, then you can spend a lot of time just sort of noodling around the data for a poorly designed experiment um, and not find any meaningful patterns at all. Uh oh, did my internet go down or did Williams? I don't know, where, where did you lose me? Oh, are you, did you finish? I saw you go on mute actually. Uh, uh, I, uh, no, I'm done. Okay, okay, cool, cool, yeah. So, um, so I think what you're really pointing at is something that I, I completely agree with, which is that this is an iterative process, right? Um, that uh, there's hypothesis generation, there's hypothesis refinement, there's hypothesis testing, and often this chain will lead to new hypotheses. And so an entire study may encompass multiple rounds of, of all of these things, right? Um, so, uh, and, and I'll be interested if you, if you sort of agree with that, um, and hypothesis, having a hypothesis can be really important when you want to do hypothesis validation and design a highly, a, a, a high powered experiment to, to, to test things. The, the reason, um, I have, I, the reason I included this in the presentation though, apart from Katie Pollard being an excellent, um, example, uh, during her talk is that, um, what I observe from all of the biology that I participate in. So I'm, I'm in a biology school, I'm in a, a, a I sit on qualifying exams, I, I sit on NIH and NSF grant sections, and I do paper review, is that people are basically trained that until they have a hypothesis that they can state, they shouldn't bother doing anything, right? They shouldn't bother trying to publish, they shouldn't come to their qualifying exam, they shouldn't, you know, submit a grant. And so I started to notice when high throughput sequencing hit that, that uh, I would get these qualifying exam proposals that were like, well, I was told I have to have a hypothesis. So they'd come up with this, what I call a, a, a BS hypothesis. If I, if I hit the mouse on a head with a hammer, RNA-seq expression will change. Like that is not a useful hypothesis, right? Um, and, but their PIs were really resistant. They've been trained that what they had to do was phrase things in this particular way. And it's really a challenge when I'm training students about data science is that I would guess that 80%, I'm, I'm making up this number. My hypothesis is that 80% of uh, data analysis is actually hypothesis free. You generated some data, you're sure there's signal in there and you're looking for it. And only once you have that, can you then go dig either into that data or better generate new data through intentional and purposeful hypothesis driven experimental design to validate that hypothesis that you came up with from the experimental, from the, the um, discovery based approach. So that's what I'm, that's sort of how I'm trying to think about these things. Yeah, that's great. And, and actually, so, and, and there's sort of two aspects of the problem, I think. What, uh, one is, or at least the way that I think of it, and I'll have to think about what you just said a little bit more, but is, is um, how do you or tool things so you can find patterns? So, so you increase your chances of being able to find patterns. Um, 
the other part is the sociology part. <laughs> how do you how do you organize yeah. effectively to do science? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That was uh, thank you. I should. I'll I'll try to uh, re I'll try to do a better job of phrasing things too. To no, well, uh, no, I, it's but the provocative approach is helpful. So I, I'll <laughs> think about it more too on my side. <laughs> Thanks.